Uh, good evening, everyone, and a very warm, warm welcome to this very clinically oriented webinar organized by the Chess Council of India. Before I start, I would just uh, want to appreciate Narayan Pradeep for bringing up this webinar once. And second, I would like to appreciate and uh, give my um, Blessings to Ravi Dosi, who actually introduced me to CCI, and now I'm part of a CCI. So today's webinar is about, can we make, yeah, it's about the role of various allergen teaching modules, testing modules in the allergy practice. So allergen testing has become a kind of uh, it's not just remain a test for some people, it has become a bread and butter and every here and there people are doing allergy testing. Now, what does actually, where do we need to do allergy testing is one question. And if we have a report of allergy testing for that matter, how should we interpret that? So this is really, really important. Any diagnostic test has its own merits and demerits and we should know before even we uh, order that. So we are going to discuss today this very important topic in another one and a half hours. I will just give an outline of how the things are going to be. I will introduce you to my faculty who are the esteemed faculty, a galaxy of stars who are there to discuss this very important topic. Please go back. Yeah, stay here only. Um, after that, we will have our guest speaker, none other than Dr. P.K. Vedantan, who is going to give you the basics of the allergies. Following that, we will go ahead and discuss the various aspects of these allergen testing modules, as well as how clinically it is relevant. After we are done with the panel discussion, it will be open for the audience to ask questions to us, and we'll be very, very happy to take it up. Before we before I go on to introduce the faculty for tonight, let me just introduce, we know allergic disease are among the most prevalent diseases worldwide and the burden of these diseases continues to increase. An accurate diagnosis, which is coupled with optimal therapy requires the use of appropriate tests to confirm the allergen sensitization and detailed information about exposure to the particular or a putative allergen. Next, please. So why actually correct diagnosis is important? See, allergic diagnosis actually can be categorized as precision medicine. Why I'm saying so? Once the diagnosis is established and the relevant allergens are identified. Next, please. Just continue to uh, one more. Right. So once we have established a diagnosis, once we have identified the relevant allergens, then specific treatments like it could be medications, it could be environmental control measures or allergen immunotherapy, they are required to achieve an optimal and long term outcomes. And believe me, it is not easy. Patients, patients just get, uh, you know, it takes long time and patients just feel for how long I have to continue. So it, it's, it's a challenge both to the uh, doctor who is treating as well as for the patients. Both have to keep the patients so that they can achieve a long-term control and optimal control. Next, please. Next, please. Yeah. So when we talk about the accurate diagnosis, we have various allergic diagnostics. Previous one, please. Previous one, please. We have various diagnostic methods which can be used. We have in vivo, we have in vitro, which includes allergen skin testing or blood test. Importance, what, why it is important to do the allergy testing, we know. But how relevant it is and what are its implications in clinical practice is what we are going to discuss in coming panel discussions. Let me introduce 
to you, to our faculty, uh, esteemed faculty today. Next, please. Next, please. We have with us our guest speaker, Dr. P.K. Vedantam, who is uh, a clinical professor in the University of Colorado, USA. So he is also chairman of Global Chest Initiatives and Init uh, International Asthma Services, USA. I have known to Sir uh, for more than 10 years and Sir is associated with CMC. Um, and he is one of the co-chairman and the founder who is... Uh, who is doing diploma in allergic asthma, which is one kind of, uh, you know, uh, a training module for a year with uh, which Sir and uh, CMC has started and it has crossed more than 10 years now. Welcome, Sir. Next, please. We have our next panelist, Dr. Pradeep Narayanan, who is the founder chairman and trustee of CCI, as well as the founder secretary of the Chest Council of India. He is currently junior medical consultant in the Department of Respiratory Medicine at District TB Center, Kasargod Government General Hospital. Welcome, Pradeep. Next, please. We have our esteemed uh, speaker panelist today again, Dr. Ravi Dosi, who is a chest physician practicing in Indore. Welcome, Ravi. Next, please. Uh, another pa panelist is Dr. Ganesh Patel, who is working as an associate professor in the Department of Pulmonology at GMC, uh, Raigad. Welcome, Dr. Ganesh. Another feather in the calf for today is Dr. Amit Chen, who is working as a consultant pulmonology at Anj Hospital, Jaipur. Dr. Amit Jain has also interest in interventional pulmonology and he has done his fellowship in that. Welcome, Dr. Amit, to the pa uh, panel discussion. So I'm done with the introduction. I would like, I would now like to invite Dr. P.K. Vedantam to deliver his guest lecture on the basics of allergy and set the stage go. Over to you, sir. Okay, thank you, Dr. Richa. It's always nice to see you. First of all, I want to thank the Chest Council of India for uh, inviting me, Dr. Narayan Pradeep, whom I know for several years when he was in Mysore. I don't know, he was with uh, JSS with Dr. Mahesh. We used to interact with him. Very promising young guy. I always felt this guy will do well and he has because he has published quite a bit. And I had the also the privilege of reviewing some of his uh, manuscripts. And I would like to thank <clears throat> the members of the executive committee of the Chest Council of India for inviting me. And I totally agree with Dr. Richa that this is an important topic. It is becoming more important. And this talk will be more towards clinician. At the same time, we need to clear some basic things because there are certain misunderstandings about what this allergy is about. So what I'm going to do is clear some basic facts and also spend a little bit more time on some of the basic ways we diagnose this problem. And then we will have the panelists ask uh, specific questions. So I may take a little more time, Dr. Richa, for this uh, initial uh, presentation. So I'm going to share the screen now. Let me see if I get it. Okay, I, can you see it? Can you see it? Okay, yes, this is from Mysore. So this is a festive season in India. So wish you all a happy Dasara. And uh, in spite of all the festivities, I'm impressed that you are keeping this uh, uh, webinar today. <clears throat> so the topic will be allergy basics. So is this disease, allergic disease, is it a new disease or an old disease? It is a very old disease with a new explanation. It is so old, this was around 2600 years before Christ, BC, the first pharaoh, Egyptian pharaoh, died suddenly. And the people around him were very bright observers. They noted that something 
external something outside caused his death and they noted it was an insect sting he had an anaphylactic reaction to wasp sting and he died right there so there is something external causing this problem was the start of wondering what is this external thing could be how can it do this you know how can it even kill a person a apparently perfectly healthy individual just killed with an insect bite right so this has been a sort of a mystery for thousands of years and many a lot of work happened i am going to go through some of it so in this talk we are going to see what is this allergy what is the mechanism what is this ige we are talking about how do we diagnose this problem what is meant by allergic progression and a few clinical points so what is the definition of an allergy it is an exaggerated immunological reaction only 50 years ago or 1968 probably to be accurate about uh, 54 years ago the mechanism of allergy was explained it was due to uh, overproduction of spe specific antibody called ige antibody this antibody was actually discovered at two places one in denver colorado in the same institution where i did my fellowship where we used to as fellows congregate two rooms down the road the corridor ishijaka couple the japanese couple who used to work very very hard even after office after hours i have seen them, you know they used to work even at nights in the lab they are the ones who discovered this ige immunoglobulin e which we all have how is it we missed it all these years we never were able to discover this particular immunoglobulin is because it is present in extremely small amounts if you look at the lab reports that you see generally you it's all most of our uh, values are expressed as milligram percent this is nanogram it's one thousandth of a milligram so we did not have technology to detect this ige antibody and when it was discovered they named it e ige because e means it designates erythema a substance that produces redness or erythema and that is how the name came in the same year dr johansson in sweden also discovered ige in a different way he had a patient who had myeloma of the b cells producing the b cells and it was not that difficult to diagnose tons of IgE floating in that patient's uh, serum and that is how IgE was discovered in two places in the same year. Now, definition shows that it is an exaggerated immunological reaction. Exaggerated means say for, for sub towards substances that are generally harmless to most of us. We don't even take notice of it. Who is going to look at dust mite? Who is going to look at pollens? We don't even pay attention to these things. But people who have got allergic problem, who have got specific IgE against these apparently harmless substances have significant reactions and they are very much aware of it. So this is an exaggerated immunological reactions to a substance that are generally harmless. And it is a classical example of gene environment interaction. This is a very fashionable word now. Lot of diseases we know now we are saying, oh, this is a gene environment interaction that's causing this problem. Now, what is the genetic problem in allergy? It is a strongly a genetic issue. And the genetic defect in an allergic individual is a compromised epithelium. So it is an epithelial cell disorder. It is not IgE, it is not mast cell, it is a compromised epithelium. The epithelium itself is weak and the cement between the cells, epithelial cells is defective, like phylogrin deficiency, like the ceramide deficiency. All these things lead to allergic disorders. To keep it very simple, if you imagine uh, your uh, house in your room, you have these tiles. And these tiles are held together with the substance what we call as a grit. As long as the grit is perfectly fine, the tiles are perfectly symmetrical and smooth. But if the grit is weak, the fluid or water can leak through the grit and it raises the, the flooring, uh, the tiles. And that's exactly what happens in allergy. The grit is weak. 
the cement between the epithelial cell is weak or damaged genetically. In addition, several of these environmental agents like dust mite, pollens, molds, all these things have what we call as proteolite proteases in them. These proteolytic enzymes take the opportunity and damage it further. So a damaged epithelium will facilitate entry of these allergens, antigens into the system and that is the defect in an allergic individual. Whereas a normal individual, the crit is perfectly fine, membrane is, is uh, pink, nice and it's strong. Even though a normal individual is exposed to the same type of environment, he's fine because his epithelium is good. In addition, an allergic individual has what we call as a skewed TH2 property. It is another genetic issue where his lymphocytes will sort of react in a TH2 pathway, an allergic pathway. Now, we also have to be careful about some of the terminologies that we use when we talk about allergy. We say, you know, that person comes from an atopic family and this person is sensitized and that person is allergic. So there are three terms here, atopy, sensitization, allergy. So we will go through that in a minute, what those, those things mean. So this is what I was talking about. This is a diagrammatic picture of the epithelium. In the epithelium, you have these tight junctions, adherent junctions, which keep all these uh, cells very, very tight. And when it is genetically defective, there's a leakage. And the, in addition to that, the allergen molecules, environmental molecules, allergens, pathogens, parallel pollutants, you know, all, you know, like diesel exhaust, all these things will damage it further and increases the permeability. And that is called leaky epithelium. And leaky epithelium is what causes the entry of the allergens. This is true in the skin. It is true in the mucous membrane of the respiratory tract, true in the GI tract. Anywhere, this is the problem. Okay. And that promotes the ent entry and allergic inflammation. Now, if you look at the mechanism of allergy, this is a diagrammatic picture, very simple picture. There are There is an antigen that is outside sitting there and there's a lining of the epithelium, which is, we, you have to imagine it as defective. So there are two phases in allergy. One is called sensitization, another is re-exposure. So initial exposure is the compromised epithelium will allow the antigen to enter through that and enters the body and in the skin as well as in the mucous membrane is it GI tract, respiratory tract, whatever. We have what we call as antigen presenting cells. Antigen presenting cells are very intelligent cells and they are named differently. They are called dendritic cells, islet of, they are also called Langerhans cells, depending upon the area there are, there are and, uh, and antigen presenting cells are also called, are, are professional antigen presenting cells, non-professional antigen presenting cell, including B cell is an antigen presenting cell. Anyway, antigen presenting cell, the function of it, it goes and picks up the allergen and chops it up and presents it to the T cell lymphocyte. When I say chops it up, like antigen which is entering is sort of crude, but it needs to be presented in a particular way to the T cell. So just like when you want to see the director of CMC, well, no, I can't just walk into the office and say, I'm so-and-so. I need to be escorted by one of the departmental heads to say, this is so-and-so. Similarly, the antigen presenting cell will escort the antigen to the T cell, T lymphocyte. Where is this T lymphocyte? Where is this action taking place? It is not happening in the skin. It is happening. It is not happening in the circulation. It is happening in the lymphatic tissues, in the regional lymph nodes. These are the areas where this allergic inflammation takes place. So the T cell will look at that particular antigen and depending upon the what we call as major histocompatibility complex or a genetic pattern, it will recognize either it's a foreign antigen or an antigen that you need to be worried about or is an antigen that you can ignore. So what the if it is a foreign antigen and the T cell recognize it as something it, it doesn't like, it will command the B cell through the help of interleukins IL-4 and IL-13. It will tell the B cell, 
produce IgE antibodies against it and this I don't want this antigen coming into the system and I want this antigen stopped wherever, whenever, wherever, whenever it comes through these IgE antibodies and that is how the B cell will start producing IgE antibodies. Generally B cell is a cell which is producing IgM, IgG and once it gets the command from the T cell it will start producing IgE and the IgE is released into circulation. There are two types of IgE, a free IgE which is circulating in the blood or in the serum, you can get it or a bound IgE which goes and gets bound to this surface receptors on the mast cell. The higher the IgE content, more the mast cell receptors are there and once the receptors are having these IgE molecules on them that is called armed mast cell and that means sensitization and this is called sensitization. A person is sensitized when that when his or her mast cell is bound by the specific IgE against that particular antigen. So it is waiting. So the re-exposure, the second arrow, the antigen enters. Imagine it's a dust mite antigen. There is no antigen presenting cell there. It just enters immediately. That antigen is picked up by those specific Ig antibodies, what we call as a coupling reaction. Two identical antibodies, Ig antibodies, which are sitting side by side will catch that antigen and that causes the antigen antibody reaction, release of all these mediators, histamine and chymase, tryptase and there are two phases in allergic inflammation. One is in early phase, another is a late phase. Early phase is the release of histamine and the chymase, tryptase and the late phase is where these uh, mediators are uh, and inflammatory mediators are formed like leukotrienes and uh, prostaglandins. So which is the one that is more important for us as far as treating asthma and allergies? It is a late phase. It is a late phase that causes the influx of all these different inflammatory cells and that is what and it is terribly powerful reaction and that is what we keep on treating with inhaled steroids is the late phase allergic reaction. The immediate phase allergic reaction like histamine release, all these really are uh, helped by antihistamines, but steroids are the mainstay to take care of the late phase reaction. So the main cell here is the T lymphocyte. The T lymphocyte is the primary cell that drives the allergic inflammation. It is not mast cell, it is not eosinophil, it is a lymphocyte. So if you look at the cross section of a lymph node, in the lymph node itself you will have what we call as T cell area, B cell area and all these reactions I am showing you takes place in the regional lymph nodes. That is why when you have people with allergies their lymph nodes can hurt a little bit. Their lymph nodes can be a little bit enlarged and there also you will find that lymphoid follicles in the back of the throat and this is because of the allergic inflammation. And if you look at the difference between a normal mucous membrane and an allergic rhinitis mucous membrane, there's a significant mucosal damage in the allergic nose with loss of cilia, intense eosinophilic infiltration, thickening of the basement membrane. So when I say thickening of the basement membrane, every time there is inflammation, there is a uh, damage to the mucous membrane and it heals and again there is a damage and it heals and that's what causes this remodeling of the airways. Remodeling of the airways is because of recurrent inflammation and repair. Inflammation and repair which occurs almost all the time 24, 7, 365. And what we also say is whenever you have an allergic patient, whether it's asthma, allergic rhinitis or just asthma alone or whatever, please look in the nasal membrane. Always do a nasal exam. And many times we just look in the throat and, and listen to the lungs but not do a nasal exam. So it's very important using a speculum because a nasal mucous membrane is a mirror of the lungs. So if you have a significant bogginess and swelling and paleness of the nasal mucous membrane, it indicates a airway remodeling. So the term again is atopy allergy sensitization. Atopy is a genetic state. If, he, if you are genetically wired, say like example, you are 10 of you here and if I ask you, you have allergies, you say no, but my uncle had allergies, my mom had allergies, I don't have any symptoms 
and when I skin test you, you don't have any skin test positive to, the, but you're still having a genetic tendency and that is called atopy. Say like I do the skin test and you are positive, but you don't have any symptoms, that means you're sensitized. But say like you are atopic and you're sensitized plus you're having symptoms, that means you're allergic. So allergy is a clinical state, atopy is a genetic state, sensitization is an immunological state. The reason I am mentioning this is when you do skin testing, when you do immunocap, when you are doing these type of laboratory techniques, what you are doing is you are not diagnosing allergy, but you are trying to find out whether the patient is sensitized or not. You are only trying to find out whether there is specific IgE present or not, because allergy is a clinical diagnosis. A clinical diagnosis is made only with the history, not with any lab test and all of you are very experienced physicians, specialists who this is something that you already know very, very well. So you can be atopic but not allergic, that means genetically wired but no symptoms. You can be sensitized but not allergic, that means you can be skin test positive but no, no symptoms at all and 20 to 30 percent of population have skin test positives but do not have any symptoms. They are not allergic, they are only sensitized. And you can be allergic and not atopic. There is a small number of us who are sensitized, uh, who are not sensitized but uh, uh, they have sudden reactions to drugs and insect allergy and so there's a little subgroup that can happen. But generally if you are allergic, you are always sensitized. Now IgE is uh, antibody which is produced by the B cell. The, as I told you before, it is both bind, bound, bound as well as free. Bound is the one that is uh, bound to the mast cell in the basophils. So when we do allergy skin testing, what you are doing is you are poking the, uh, the skin uh, creating a very, very small hole a few millimeters wide and the antigen enters as soon as the, and it enters the dermis, if the mast cells are there on which these are uh, specific Ig antibodies are sitting, the reaction takes place. So a skin testing will only react towards the bound IgE. When you are doing immunocap, it is the free IgE that is present in the blood or in the serum. That's what you are measuring. Now, Indian population, because of non-specific stimulants have a high IgE normally. So when you have a high IgE, many times it gives false positive immunocap. So you have to be very, very careful when you read immunocap results in an Indian population, especially for foods. This is a lot of false positive reactions. Now, another important thing is fetus is capable of producing IgE from eighth week of gestation itself. So, and the IgE being a high molecular weight, 180,000 uh, is the molecular weight, it cannot cross the placenta. So sometimes cord blood is used as a screening for allergies. Now, how do you diagnose allergies? There are three steps. Step one, step two, step three. What is, what are those steps? If there are three steps are history, history, history. You may be surprised to know this, but History is the most important component of diagnosis. It is not skin testing, it's not Ig, it is not immunocap. Because as I just mentioned to you, they only indicate sensitization. They do not indicate allergy. So it is imperative that you have to have a good history to make a diagnosis of allergy. And how does a history help you? As you are taking the history from the patient, you can actually imagine the pathophysiology. As the patient says, I am stuffy, that indicates usually some anatomical problem or a swelling of the tissues, probably because of inflammation. The patient says, I'm sneezing, I'm itching, that indicates that histamine release. And these are all things that has to go through in your mind as you are taking the history. So once you are done with the history, uh, allergic history is a very detailed history. People who have taken the fellowship know that. 
or the training for the training it's a detailed history this is one history where you spend a lot of time figuring out not only patient symptoms what is the environment around him what type of animal pets what type of bedroom he sleeps in what type of pillow he sleeps what type of other exposures he has whether there's a family history and all sorts of different things we take and the patient is wondering who is this doctor taking so many questions i never had any other doctor ask me so many questions he's asking me about my bedroom and this and that and uh, so allergic history is as a very comprehensive history the reason for that is the history is the one that gives you the diagnosis and as well as the disease progression as well as the prognosis in order to confirm your clinical impression then you do the skin testing or the immunocap or whatever so what do you do after the initial patient interview? You look at the clinical impression. You, you look at what, what the impression is and then you decide what type of test. Some people will need only few skin tests and there's, there's a basic screen based upon the history. I don't feel allergies are playing a big role in you. So I just want to do a basic screen. I look at the most common antigens like dust mite, cockroach, alternaria, mold, and a few in the pollens. And the 10 skin tests is enough for us to know whether you are an allergic, or whether you are a sensitized person or not. If it's a pediatric patient, I don't want to do too many tests. We, have, we analyzed about 2000 charts in our clinic in Bangalore and found that 10 antigens 10 antigens pick up 80% of the sensitization. So that means you don't have to do 80 tests to find out. The maximum number of tests that are done is around 35, but 10 to 15 skin tests will tell us uh, most of the sensitization the patient has. So once you uh, plan the test, you need to explain to the patient why you are doing this test. Before you touch the patient to doing skin testing, you should describe what the test involves. You should also tell them what they can expect, why you're doing it, what are the limitations and what is the cost. And if it is a very small child and all that who is very much afraid, you can do a sample of two skin tests and that will allay the fears a lot. So in allergy testing, you have what we call as in vivo testing, in vitro testing. In vivo is allergy skin testing, which has got percutaneous or epicutaneous. Under that, you have prick, puncture and scratch. They're all basically same. We do the prick. There are slight differences in the uh, uh, technique. In the prick test, where you put the drop and then scratch through. In the puncture, you go straight in through the drop. In the scratch, you scratch and then put the drop. There is a test called prick on prick. This is done mostly for food allergies because a lot of food antigens are not very potent or not very good. And the due to storage, they undergo changes. So the clinical correlation on food skin testing is poor. So that is why we take a little bit non-standardized method where we take actual food like a fruit or a vegetable or whatever, take a little piece of that through a, a 20 gauge needle and put it on the skin and then prick through it and still having a histamine saline control and doing having another person with a, who doesn't have any such history as a control. And that is called prick on prick, which is much more useful. And there is an intradermal technique, which is uh, 500 times more sensitive than prick test. So whenever you have a very highly sensitive test, you get a lot of false positives. In vitro, you have a test where you determine the total IgE. I want to spend two minutes on this. Total IgE is used as a screening test by many, many physicians in the community, and it is a total waste. Your total IgE is not a good screening test because a total IgE may be with a normal range and that amount of whatever IgE you are measuring can be directed towards particular antigen and it could all be specific and you don't know because if you look at the total IgE, the number may be small, maybe within normal range, but it could all be specific. So if you want to do in vitro testing, always do specific IgE. Do not do total IgE. This is an important message because it's an expensive test and is a total waste. There are only two times we do two indications for total IgE. One is to figure out the dose of amalizumab for asthma and also for uh, ABPA as a follow-up. That are the only two times we do it and occasionally hyper IgG syndrome. Then you have got all these uh, basophil activation uh, tests and all that. Those are all lab for research technique, not for clinicians. Microarray is again terribly expensive. It is unnecessary. They test for hundreds of things at the same time. 15,000 rupees uh, down the drain to figure out one allergy. So of all the tests, I would say 
prick skin test is the most effective, most sensitive, clinically correlating test. And immunocap is good, but it is expensive and it has less clinical sensitivity uh, uh, correlation. Patch testing is not a regular allergy testing at all. You know, it is not IG mediated. It is a type 4 reaction. It is nothing to do with B cells. It's a T cell phenomena. So many times it is not considered as an allergy test and the mechanism is totally different. Challenges are done nowadays under control conditions, oral food challenge, inhalation challenge, conjunctival challenge, nasal challenge. These are things that should be done in a fully fledged equipped allergies office, not in uh, office where you are just doing some screening for allergies. So these challenges should not be done uh, when if you are not at fully fledged allergy center because of risks. And as I just mentioned, these are uh, some of the things that you need to know. Some a few small differences between prick test and uh, intradermal test. Prick test, I think, is the best test where you, it is less sensitive, but it is more. Uh, it is sensitive, but I'm sorry, there's a little typo there. It should be more sensitive and less specific. Whereas intradermal is 500 times more sensitive, and it is a lot of false positives. And these are pictures showing you the prick test and intradermal testing. And definition of a positive prick test is uh, more than three millimeters wheel above a negative control. And or if it is immunocap specific IG more than 0.35 KU per liter, and they only mean sensitization, they do not mean allergy. This is something I keep on repeating. And these are some of the differences between allergy prick test and immunocap. Allergy prick test is a simple test. It measures bound IgE, which is actually what happens in nature. It is safe, less it is a, it gives immediate results. It's quite sensitive, about 80%, clinically relevant, affordable, influenced by medication. That is the only limitation. Whereas immunocap is extremely specific, it's quite sensitive, but clinically a little bit less relevant than the prick skin test and measures free IgE, which is not the natural thing and it is quite expensive. Why do, when we say progressive, a few points here is allergy is a progressive disease. None of the guidelines will talk about it. So how do you know allergic disease is progressive is only by taking history when the patient comes for uh, checkups. So the patient, you may say, how is your boy doing? How is your uh, daughter or son doing? They say, it's not bad, but the frequency of the symptoms are uh, a lot better since you put on medicines, but it's getting a little, whenever I miss the medicine, it seems to come on, the attack comes on. Or there is mild symptoms occurring in spite of medications, or he is coughing a little bit more at night, but daytime he seems to do well. So all these subtle points, reduced response to medications, increased need for medications, increased time taken for the symptoms to respond, or patients having lower airway symptoms like coughing at night or coughing with physical activity are all signs of progression of allergic rhinitis, which is a very progressive disease. None of the pharmacotherapy agents will stop the progression. So no pharmacotherapy in our center in Mysore we found that it's a since a tertiary center we followed about 1200 patients 72 percent progress from allergic rhinitis to asthma symptoms in 18 months so it is a very very fastly progressive disease and the only thing that can slow down the progression or stop the progression occasionally reverse the progression is allergen immunotherapy because and this is something you need to always have in your office. If you don't have the auto injector, at least have the crude one, a pre-filled syringe with epinephrine for emergencies. So let me stop here. I'm sorry it took a little long uh, time for you, but I wanted to cover some of the important points. Uh, fee and we will uh, open uh, Dr. Richa for panel discussion. Again, I thank the CCR organization for this educational exercise. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for such a nice, comprehensive and uh, to the point insight into the basics of uh, allergy. Actually, lots of doubts actually for me also got 
clear today. <laughs> we do not give so much importance in our busy OPD, but I know I understand how important it is. So, <laughs> are we all ready to go for the panel discussion? All right. So, uh, we have five, five panelists sitting here. So I, I, I thought initially to ask about, you know, the various lab methods and other things, which uh, PKV Star has actually very nicely covered. But for the people who have joined a little late, may, may I ask uh, Dr. Narayan Pradipa to just quickly summarize <clears throat> the various lab methods uh, which is used for diagnosing allergy in patients and which method you feel uh, you think is best. Uh, in the for the patient uh, for the people who have joined late in their interest otherwise sir has really explained it very well to us uh, thank you madam thank you vedantan sir for the uh, wonderful presentation in that the outset uh, i would thank uh, dr nh krishna who is the founder of cci <laughs> um, and he has suggested the names and everything he has done from his side so every week he spends uh, hours together to make one event uh, happen so thank you, uh, thank you, uh, uh, office bearers of the CCA president and uh, Dr. Ash, the base secretary, Dr. Anil, and uh, Dr. Atri, who is working every minute for a CCA. Mm -hmm. um, re uh, regarding the tests, uh, the uh, sir has already summarized like to travel from Kasaragod Road to CMC. There are multiple ways. Either I can travel, take a flight from Mangalore to go to Chennai, then travel by road, or I can take a train and uh, go to Paimbut. Through Kaimbutra, I can come to uh, Katapati and uh, get down there. <laughs> so, multiple ways in uh, allergy testing, also, multiple uh, tests are there in, in vitro tests and in vivo test. <clears throat> so, it's all uh, how suitable it is in your practice. Uh, so, uh, I, uh, it is not like what is the best. If you ask what is the best, uh, it is very difficult to answer, but there is something called suitable, which is suitable in your place, in suitable for in your practice. You may be in a rural area, you may be in a tertiary care center, you may be in a secondary care settings, you may be in a corporate hospital. All will have a different uh, uh, areas, but what is suitable for you uh, is you have to pick up. So uh, basically, a skin prick test is suitable for everybody. It can be done every places, and it is very simple to learn and very simple to practice also so i feel uh, among the, all the tests uh, this allergy skin prick test we have to should practice more and more and we have to give evidence to the, our patients to tell this is good or this is bad <clears throat> thank you right uh, i agree with you pradeep uh, ravi uh, what do you think among the various allergen skin test uh, which in your practice, you feel is the best and more acceptable to the patients. <laughs> Ravi, are you there? Uh, well, ma'am, uh, first of all, I would like to begin. Yeah, I'm there, ma'am. Am I am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, basically, I would like to begin by thanking Krishna, sir, for this very innovative and clinically relevant topic. Uh, I would like to thank the esteemed uh, faculties which are all a part of this webinar and I am glad I am also a part of this webinar. Well, ma'am, like, uh, like Vedantan sir has told, like in your initial slides you had told, like Aryan Pradeep sir just told, that skin prick testing stands as practical, effective uh, test for uh, allergy testing which we clinically use. Out of the several in vitro and in vivo tests which are available, skin prick testing offers a very comfortable uh, place for both the clinician as well as the patient to understand and an actual demonstration of that allergy gives a lot of positive feedback that yes, this is what the problem is and this is how we, may, we are going to tackle it. So skin prick testing, I would feel is a very very reliable method to understand sensitization to different allergens and uh, it is also as uh, several guidelines be it european guidelines the indian guidelines american guidelines all of them tell that it is the gold standard for determining allergen specific ige uh, skin prick testing is the absolute best right very well said ravi 
and uh, sir has already uh, spoken about that and actually skin prick test is very much accepted by the uh, pediatric population as well i mean they do scared but uh, once you show it uh, they 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 take it up easily right so sir pkb sir i want to ask you uh is allergy testing required in all the patients who presents with symptoms suggestive of asthma or allergic rhinitis or 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 any other allergic manifestation okay uh it's a very very good practical question do everybody know and need it when they have this history that is the question now my slide showed that if it is an allergic disease if you suspect it's an allergic disease you have to assume it is going to progress especially in pediatric age group it is going to progress fast in the first 15 to 20 years so th there are three antigens that i always worry about one is dust mite another thing is cockroach third thing is a mold cock alternaria and we call these three antigen asthmogenic these are the three antigens that causes asthma pollens do cause asthma but not as much and we don't have too many indoor pets uh, in india but it's changing so cats there are more indoor people now but when i grew up all the pets were outside so anyway my answer to your question is it is not a bad idea to do a small panel of skin tests just like you do pft on all these patients just do maybe five to seven skin tests and you don't have to treat them but it gives you an idea you know there is some sensitization occurring why don't you go ahead and do some environmental control and uh, let us uh, see how things go but important thing in pediatric population is say like you are seeing the patient uh, the child in six months or a year you can repeat the same skin test and see what happens it is interesting to see there is what we call as new sensitization new allergy new reaction sensitization will occur as well as the existing reactions will get bigger so that is called immunological progression we talked about clinical progression a few minutes ago this is called immunological progression so an immunological progression clinical progression is an indication for allergen immunotherapy okay so right. so uh, this is something that because we know that most of the medications that we use are effective to reduce the symptoms but no medication will work on the t cell so the only modality that works is cell. so what you could do is you know this is something i think we need to get an opinion from an allergy doctor allergy special why don't you go and see him or something if you are not doing immunotherapy which is more complicated you can refer them to an allergy center and so this by so message is chest physicians doing skin testing i think is an excellent idea because you are you are going to pick up atopic patients i mean allergic patient i mean uh, sensitized patients and your referral pattern will be a lot more better right sir <clears throat> uh also sir this is a question uh, i wanted to ask you we said that cockroach is one of those uh, you know one of the important uh, allergen in indian setup so many of the patients actually they will come with a cockroach like you know when you do an ast they found that cockroaches they are sensitized to that they are so uh, they asked me we are not in contact with cockroach how come i am sensitive to cockroach and how should i avoid that so the, okay cockroach nobody will admit i have cockroach in my bedroom okay so even maharaja this has more cockroach i think so but anyway cockroach is an integral part of our household because especially in a temperate in, in tropical countries a cockroach likes two things one moisture another is food and so most of the cockroaches are present in the kitchen or in the bathroom and they are traveling up and down these drainage tubes and they are very clever actually and they come out when everything is quiet there's proboscis that the cockroach has and sensitize can figure out what's happening who is awake and who is uh, is there the light on or something like that so no cockroach will come in the daytime that much but only at night they come out 
and uh, it is not uncommon for us to go if you were go to the kitchen at 10 at one o'clock in the morning to get some water you will see a small conference going on there cockroach conference so these things are there other thing is people's eating habits have changed now people we used to eat in the kitchen and after eating we would clean up the area but nowadays people all eat using you know dinner tables and now another thing what has happened is they also are do not pay attention to what they are eating they are only watching the tv or something or the cell phone and what happens is when you are not attentive on the food food particles will start falling so it is not uncommon for small small food particles around the dinner table nobody pays attention to it but the cockroaches do so, so that will attract cockroach another thing what has happened now you have tv in the bedroom also people eat in the bedroom also so even in the bedroom the cockroach can be there so all these things will add up to the antigen load and the next morning the maid will come and just start brooming you know uses the broom and that percolates the cockroach antigen which is present in the fecal matter and the two things i tell my students is when you see a cockroach i have done the same mistake many many times is don't kill the cockroach don't take a broomstick and kill the cockroach because what happens with this you are going to produce a huge amount of allergens uh, which is spread because the cockroach antigen is present in the scales it is present in the resp in the gi tract you know and so there will be a huge amount of cockroach antigen that will be present on the you are happy i killed the cockroach but actually you caused a big problem and my wife is a little bit very non-violent person you know she will always used to tell me don't king don't king don't king but don't kill the cockroach but now i have a scientific reason not to and uh, so that is one thing and another thing second thing is when the maid comes to clean your house Tell her not to broom first, first to do wet mopping that will pick up all the antigen, then broom, not broom and then wet mop. So these are two practical things. Right, and so by, practical, I would say. <laughs> yeah. And by professional having a pest control, it is extremely effective to reduce, uh, to control the cockroach. It's right, very effective. Sir. Thank you so much, sir, for giving the practical tip. I use my chapel to kill the cockroach, actually. So I will <laughs> stop doing that. <laughs> and so, <laughs> right. Coming. Amit, are you there? Yeah. Amit, I just want you to know, sir, has told that uh, we don't have to do a whole battery of the test. We need to be very specific. And there are three of the tests, three particular antigen and country, which are responsible for most of the allergies. What are your thoughts about it? You know, patient comes with a big list of allergy testing uh, thing. They have a booklet actually when they come to us. Uh, specifically, uh, with due respect to all the Bengali fans or Bengali people who are there, but in West Bengal, they, they, they come with a full booklet which will be having some 45, 50 allergens uh, tested and all marked, uh, uh, you know, positive, 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 positive positive and lots of food allergens also do, uh, they do. What are your thoughts about it? You know, first of all, uh, those type of tests are run either by skin testing or by blood test. Okay. And you say, for example, you believe the tests are done properly. What the test is showing you is sensitization, not allergy. Okay, so when you ask the history from the patient, they will say, you know, I am drinking milk. The, the doctor told me to stop drinking because it showed up on the cheek. It doesn't mean anything because we know there are positive reactions to milk, but nothing happens when they drink. So what, hap what is more important is what happens when they drink the milk rather than this piece of paper showing some positive reactions. So there are a lot of false positives, especially with foods. When you have a positive skin test to a food, we know the positive predictive value of food skin testing is only 40%. That means positive predictive value means a positive skin test in the presence of the disease is only 40% of the time, 60% of the time you don't know what it means. So you are very confused and that is why we have this oral food challenge. Now also doing 80 to 100 skin tests or blood tests is a lot of waste of money. It only helps the doctor to get a much better car, Audi or Mercedes, but not the patient. And uh, the thing to do is limit the number of skin tests. 
do not do remote allergy practice that means you go to that lab and get this test done then i will talk to you don't do that because the lab is very happy to run those tests because it's a very good source of income patient is impressed because he is getting you know patient it's very interesting allergic patient feels happy when you say you have, they have allergies when these patients who come to allergies if you say you don't have allergies they will not feel very good they will go and tell someone their friend you know i don't have allergies this doctor told me i don't have allergies oh you this doctor told you you don't have allergies go to that doctor at the corner with a big board he will tell you are allergic to everything go there and that thing happens so it is a very very unfortunate thing but needs a lot of education so basically point is i would not suggest anyone doing those type of tests and always do a history and do a few skin tests based upon the history is probably the best way to handle this problem right. rightly said sir amit yes, what are your thoughts about it and how do you deal with such patients who come with a long list of you know allergy testing booklets with you for you Uh, yeah, first of all thank you ma'am thank you so much cci family and all the esteemed panelists coming back to the question ma'am what i do for see that they have mentioned uh, the material material by which means if there is mentioning of the they have done by immunocap or what method 90% right. of the reports and booklets what the patients carry with they do not mention what method they have used and they will just say ki they have taken this much of amount and they have taken Uh, done allergy testing for this much of allergens so they are quite happy about that then the second step of uh, from my side is i ask them to throw that book straight up right because there is of no and then 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 the uh, then the actually uh, what we start is from the uh, history taking yeah if there is any uh, Uh, localizing things localizing allergens we can uh, come on the clinical impression then we go for uh, testing for that particular allergens only and for them also only if they are uh, symptomatic enough to go for that and then we uh, go uh, accordingly one word of caution yes. can i tell one yes, see sir, people yes. come there are two types of uh, in vitro uh, one is called ige rast or ige which is a uh, make sense to look for ige but there is also another test called igg rast which is a very very it's totally a useless test because igg is a type of response we all do normal people also whenever we are exposed to any type of agent our immune system will recognize that particular substance and produce igg so we all produce thousands of types of I igg to thousands of things so if you are testing me i don't have allergy you test me i will have like positive to igg rast about 80 things so it doesn't mean anything so you have to look at that and discourage people going through these type of tests right sir and i believe i think uh, uh, this correlating the allergy skin testing if the patient is coming with the list of uh, already with an ast correlating with the history and you know reconfirming it by yourself is probably a good uh, step so all of us agree that uh, uh, of the various allergen testing modules allergen skin testing particularly the skin prick test is one of the uh, best one e and acceptable easy to do as well So coming to Ravi, coming uh, Ravi to you. What do you think are the contraindications to do the allergen skin testing? Uh, well, ma'am, uh, we should avoid first of all allergy testing in patients who are less than four years of age or in extremely elderly patients. We should we should avoid them in patients who are having cardiovascular conditions or suffering from arrhythmias. 
if a person has had a recent anaphylactic reaction you might get false negative it is better to avoid it uh, if a person has dermographism or eczema then he might be having false positive for practically everything so better to avoid in those patients and we're not consenting patients patients who don't uh, who are explained and they are not ready to agree to the methodology or who are very violent and irritable they should be avoided and particularly one very important group is patients who are on several drugs like antidepressants are there antihistaminics are there antiallergics are there there is a whole list of such medicines which need to be checked and if they are on those drugs it is better to stop the drug for some time and then go in for an allergy testing right right can i clarify there a little bit sorry sir yes sir please can i clarify there so one yes. as far as the age goes actually you can do skin testing any age i have done skin done skin testing even at 6 months of age okay but you don't want to go and do 20 of them you just want to do maybe four or five and extremes of age is a problem because the the skin becomes very fragile as they get older as far as the the antihistamines generally we stop about 3 to 5 days most of the antihistamines except estimazole can last a much many long very long very few people use it any longer and steroids do not seems to contraindicate tricyclic antidepressant we stop for 2 to 3 weeks we stop before and as far as contraindication to skin testing there is very very few contraindications for skin testing okay uh, and uh, the thing is um, uh, there was another if somebody is uh, afraid okay then you could go ahead and do just a sampling initially like we mentioned before and also there is a, a local anesthetic cream that is available for children i forgot the name of it uh, it is a uh, forgot the name but it, there's a local anesthetic cream which you can put on like 20 minutes before they come for the office and you can do skin testing and it won't interfere with the testing okay so there's a local anesthetic cream like that uh dr ganesh this is one for you uh what do you think are the prerequisites before we plan doing allergy testing uh, thank you ma'am uh, my sincere thanks to the organizing committee uh, for providing opportunity to sit my with my mentors like pk sir and richa ma'am uh, coming to the question uh, so as to make procedure productive and minimize the errors the proper patient selection and proper allergen panel has to be chosen so like sir told a good history number 1 is history number 2 is history and number 3 is history because it helps to choose the limited number of allergens and establish a temporal relationship because unless we don't know the patient if we keep on doing our spt we don't know what is the first patient what is the second patient what is the third patient there might be a patient who needs uh, who is having a uh, perennial allergy probably he is having indoor allergen he is having uh, sensitization to house dust mite and indoor allergens only in that person we don't need to perform uh, some pollens or something like that like sir told that we if we narrow down our allergen panel we can do justice so a proper history is very mandatory after that a uh, pet exposure biomass uh, history list of medications and past medical and surgical history is needed like sir told that h1 antihistaminics uh, as a rule we are uh, stopping it one week prior antihistamine nasal spray uh, we don't stop it h2 receptor antagonist we don't stop topical glucocorticoids there are some studies that it impairs the mast cell activity that's why we stop it omalizumab we don't perform tricyclic antidepressant two weeks prior and Higher doses of methotrexate also it impairs our SPT. Likewise, we should ask for the onset of symptoms, character, duration, frequency, severity of symptoms, localized versus systemic uh, reaction, so that we can narrow down our uh, allergen panel. And uh, like sir told that we should explain our procedure prior, and it should not be a panic for the patient. in between the test there should not be any surprise for the patient so we should introduce ourselves we should explain in clear and simple words what we are going to perform and if the patient is in still in panic 
we can perform on our skin also because it's not painful there should not be any surprise for the patient at any stage and after reading the skin testing uh, always thank the patient Uh, Amit, would you like to just summarize? Uh, Ganesh has told us what are the prerequisites, what are the drugs, uh, uh, how and when it should be stopped. Would you like to summarize again the drugs which has no effect on the skin testing results and which does not require to be stopped prior to doing skin testing? Drugs uh, which are not required to stop for doing a AST, especially we are talking about uh, firstly steroids. If the any patient is on inhaled steroids, that's not that need not to be stopped. And if a patient for any reason is taking long term steroid of uh, less than ten mg per day of prednisolone equivalent for a long uh, long duration, then that also that uh, need not to be stopped. Uh, similarly, antidepressants and antipsychotics, as a broad category, uh, should be stopped. But particularly, uh, uh, this uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor (SSRIs) and SNRIs, they, they can they need not to be stopped. And similarly, uh, uh, leukotriene antagonists, Montelukast, can be given, and PPIs, antibiotics, these can also be continued. Sure. Thanks, Amit. Uh, Ravi. Uh, would you tell us how do we read the results of the skin prick, uh, skin prick test or AST? Well, after some uh, twenty twenty five minutes of application of your uh, allergens and the pricks, you have a reaction, a local reaction, which happens on the forearm or back wherever you have applied that particular antigen, and in that you get a wheel and an erythema. A wheel is a hard induration which you can feel it with the pulp of your finger, and it is visible redness. So it is the wheel which has to be measured basically. Now it is graded into three millimeter, five millimeter, eight millimeter, eleven millimeter. Several classifications also, or clinically, it is also graded as one plus, two plus, three plus, four plus. But it should be avoided. Ideally, it should be reported in terms of millimeter or with respect to the positive histamine which we are using. as a positive control or saline which we are using as a negative control that would be the best way to uh, measure your skin prick test and uh, i would also like to add one more count we have an uh, 861 logins to our webinar up till now so a uh, congratulations to all the panelists uh can i add a little bit there yes sir uh for histamine peak at 10 minutes so you have to look at it at 10 minutes For inhalants, it is fifteen minutes, not twenty-five minutes. Fifteen. It doesn't have to be exact fifteen. Fifteen to twenty is fine. Okay. And the imp important thing when you do skin testing is tell two things to the patient. One, not to scratch locally on the site of the injection because histamine can makes you itch, and also positive reactions can make make you itch a little bit. so they have to stay away from itching scratching there and they should not just disappear from the scene they should be visible to your office staff they should sit in one place and wait because sometimes they just go in especially children start going out and playing and that can cause a reaction also so and that is something you need to let them know and you whenever you do skin testing in addition to asking about medication one question you should ask is are you do you have symptoms uh, of fainting you know like vasovagal type of issues uh, after drawing blood or something because uh, never do any type of procedure standing you should at least be sitting or lying down so these are certain practical things that we need to know and also when you do skin testing we can teach you in these uh, workshops how to exactly to do it this is difficult for me to explain here but the exact technique is very important because the material that you use for skin testing is another very important a lot of indigenous material especially for dust mite cockroach and ultraria are not very good actually according to the study done at cmc the dust mite that was available locally is only about 6 to 26% potency 75% of the time it is not potent at all so we generally tell people to go ahead and get some imported antigens for those three 
because these are asthmogenic antigens get right. good quality antigen very important so you do everything right and then you test with the wrong stuff what is the use so then you will be very confused clinically you suspect immunologically it is negative so it becomes very difficult so it's important to get good quality antigens and sir, there is several questions on the chat box do yes, you want sir to i'm just yeah coming on that sir so one of the friends dr aruna shanmugatan has asked something which i was supposed to ask as well so <laughs> what are the standardized allergies available for skin testing as many of them are not standardized and we are facing the difficulty actually now um as well so what do you think in india what are the i mean do you have the do you know the vendors okay you know like stand what let us see what is what do you mean by standardization is something we need to first talk standardization means it is not potency it only means consistency it also means what tells on the label is what is present in the particular preparation say like amoxicillin says 875 mg you analyze it it will be 875 and if you look at different batches it will remain 875 that is not true with allergic antigens you see so in usa out of the 75 allergens that are available here only 19 are standardized does it mean the other 56 are bad quality not really you can have good quality non standardized antigens also okay standardization is consistency so depending upon the batch it can vary a little bit so in india what i generally as i just mentioned to you is pollens are not bad at all you could use the local pollens it makes sense to use local pollens and dust mite cockroach and alternaria the, those three generally we tell people to go ahead and get it uh, Uh, imported there are few people who import these antigens i don't know if i am supposed to give their names on a public setting like this right, so sir. i may not do that you know so but it is available through some uh, uh, sources where you can get these quality and you need to know those are very expensive but if you do the skin test carefully it will be cost effective so try to get good quality stand, uh, good quality potent antigens even though like for example cockroach antigen is not a standardized antigen even in the us but it is good quality so uh, we, we should get good quality potent antigens is the answer for right, important sir. asthmogenic antigens right, uh, there is other question um, they are asking should we do allergy testing in asthma copd overlap patients you know that is a good question what do you do with that type of test is the question okay chances are you will definitely not put that patient on immunotherapy okay now if at all the patient is wondering you know do, do you think allergies are playing a role in my problem or something like that you could do what i would do in those patients is just do a very basic screen so maybe 10 skin tests and do environmental control against dust mite and a few things like cockroach or something like that if it is a problem because we know that these patients allergies are may not be playing a major role but it could to some extent i would never definitely not consider any type of active intervention like immunotherapy and all that so maximum we will do for these patients would be uh, some pharmacotherapy and environmental control and by doing skin testing two things happen one say like the patient has a positive reaction it it, it acts as a a good positive uh, item for you to discuss and you will get better compliance because the patient is seeing something you tell we generally tell the patient you know this is what's happening in your airways there's it's like a wound there's a little bit of a wound there so it is better for you to do these control measures and better for you to take these inhaled steroids on a regular basis so it will reduce this wound so you get better compliance right sir uh, uh dr ganesh the question which you answered that what are the prerequisites so one of our friend has asked why the tcas need to be stopped before the allergy skin testing would you like to answer that why tricyclic antidepressant needs to be stopped uh actually ssris uh, they do not affect the skin testing but tcas the impair uh 
reason pk sir will tell you <laughs> ma'am tricyclic antidepressants are the ones that have got antihistamine activity okay i don't know the trade names okay not all and not all antidepressants okay tricyclic antidepressants can influence allergy skin test not for two days for a couple of weeks Quality. so it becomes a, yes so in these patients who really need this it is it is a challenge to stop such medications because they need it for their to control their psychological issues so in these patients you may be forced to do an immunocap selectively because uh, uh, you it all depends upon you have to weigh the uh, the benefit risk benefit ratio if you are risking a significant flare up of the psychological issues better not to go with skin testing go with the immunocap okay for those patients selectively so so you have to look at each patient individually there's nothing like a blanket uh, recommendation for everyone right sir just for sir, uh, today today is yeah, today is dasara and uh, pe uh, vedanta sir was a little bit uh, worried whether the uh, audience will be there more than 900 audience have joined so you will be oh, really <laughs> i thought only eight people were listening <laughs> <laughs> so it will be a home coming so you have come oh. to uh, dasra <laughs> dasra oh wow it's uh, a big so okay. he said uh, the price can getting cut off person which are commonly used it. what i was saying was the triety Adoxifen and amitriptyline. Could you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can uh, hear you now. No, what I was saying was the common TCAs which are used in India are amitriptyline. The yes, uh, you have to stop that. that. Yeah, and doxifen. Okay. Yes. So somebody yeah. is asking from Maharashtra: Is the antigen to be tested are different for if the patient has only rhinitis and in the patients who have both rhinitis and asthma? Not really. because both are inhalant diseases and you know that this there is we talk about this united airways they are all one airway we have made artificially we have created this allergic rhinitis asthma and all that but you take an allergic rhinitis patient and do a bronchial alveolar lavage you will find the same interleukins il4 il13 as well as eosinophils in the lavage without any symptoms so that means allergic rhinitis patients have a reactive airway component going on without any symptoms okay so you have to consider it as one disease one airway and not divide it and uh, artificially because uh, uh, disease wise it is one airway right sir and uh, there is a question for you sir from dr bansal in delhi uh, that you mentioned about the 10 allergens in children which can pick up 80% of the sensitization so she wants to know about if you could enumerate them it would be very helpful yeah i know gorika bansal very well so she is graduate of the delhi program and uh, she out of uh, those three 10 antigens the three most important ones are the dust mite cockroach and alternaria okay then you can pick about two different pollens depending upon the area you know like um, in india they do these botanical names uh, which i am the sorghum and uh, you know i am not uh, two grasses and two weeds that will be easy for me to say because i am not very familiar with all the botanical names so and the saline control so basically it comes to around 10 antigens so two pollens i mean four pollens dust mite cockroach and alternaria saline and histamine one thing i want to point out here when you do skin testing it, you have to pay very uh, huge uh, huge importance to controls just because as you say like you do the skin testing and the patient has positive don't jump right away and say oh yeah everything is positive let me measure first look at the controls if the controls are not satisfactory the test may not be satisfactory so the saline has to be either 0 0 to 3 mm is what is allowed and the histamine should be at least 4 mm or more 
so what does the histamine mean histamine positive reaction means there is no interference there are no antihistamines or any other interfering agents floating in the patient's serum so the test is reliable that's what it means so that means you can proceed if the histamine say like has a dust mite reaction to 7 by 8 and the mold is 8 by 8 but the histamine is only 2 by 2 that test is no good you have to repeat it later that histamine has to be positive four millimeters or more say if it is saline thing it could be zero or up to three millimeters and that only indicates what we call as a baseline reactivity of the skin everybody's skin is different and also depends on much how much pressure you put when you do the prick testing so up to three millimeters is allowed there are a few people whose skin is a little more sensitive not dermographism just so they even for saline they start reacting five millimeters like that so for those patients you have to do what we call as correction five plus three anything more than eight millimeters is positive for those patients so you need to and we will go through this when we do the skin testing workshops and i would suggest your organization to strongly consider uh, offering skin testing workshops uh, with right. our allergy we have several allergy organizations and this will help you to feel a lot more comfortable by doing this type of test in your office so um i think to all the panelists we are left with some 10 to 15 minutes so i'll just pick up some important questions as well uh, one of the questions open to everyone, what do you think is the mechanism for post-viral airway hypersensitivity? Uh, virus is rampant, right? H1N1 is rampant all over the country. So I think that's a pretty relevant question if anybody wants to answer. What do you think is the mechanism for post-viral airway hypersensitivity? You could answer actually. <laughs> <laughs> so someone yeah ganesh ganesh will take up <laughs> why me <laughs> yes sir is there yeah Post-viral, it is very, uh, actually cough is uh, prolonged too much, more than two weeks, sometimes even up to six weeks, but it is self-limiting. So it gives an idea that uh, 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 it is not a progressive disease. It's Why a, something like, uh, yeah, uh, cause, effect, cause and effect, that's all. It is hit and run, but uh, it is not progressive. That is the basic difference between the allergic uh, hypersensitivity reactions and the uh, infective uh, hypersensitivity reactions. Viral infections and allergies are very close cousins. Mm. So they have done some studies where they treated with omalizumab in the asthmatics very successfully and found these flare-ups, spring and fall flare-ups due to viral infection significantly is reduced in these patients. So when the allergies are better, you, they get less viral infections. When the allergies are more, they get more viral infections. And allergies and viral infections are, have an additive effect. It makes things a lot more worse. So it is very important in these patients to control the allergic problem so that the viral infections will be much better tolerated. And the other thing what happens is both cause mucosal damage. A viral infection causes mucosal damage, allergens cause mucosal damage, and that actually exposes these nerve endings and also the mediators that are there, and that provokes these uh, cough, coughing and respiratory problems. And, and the thing what, what we need to know is we seem to be very much worried about RSV, but actually you have to more worry more about RV. A simple cold virus, respiratory virus, causes 10 times more asthma compared to RSV. RV is more asthmogenic than RSV. RSV can cause significant lower airway airways, but RV causes a lot more asthma. And there is no prophylactics against RV, but I think there is RV, there is RSV, you do have some antiviral prophylaxis, I think. It's, I don't know about India, there is some here. Uh, 
Okay. Mean duration of immunotherapy, should I go ahead and is three to five years. So one more question on environmental control. <laughs> Pardon? Uh, you, a few things. You want me to talk about environmental control? Yeah. Okay. The major ones about environmental control is one, if you look at uh, in India, the major allergen is dust mite. What is a major allergen means if you take 100 sensitized people and look at their sensitivity, more than 50% of them react to that particular antigen. That is called major antigen. So dust mite, about 82% of people who are sensitized in India react to dust mite. So dust mite is a major antigen. So where is the dust mite? Dust mite likes two things. One, it likes dust uh, moisture. It also likes warmth. So moisture and warmth are both provided by human body. So when you sleep on your uh, uh, bedding, you are providing both moisture and warmth, keeps the dust mite very comfortable. It likes to sleep with you, but it doesn't sleep. So when you are sleeping, the dust mite actually is quite active at night. And actually, where is the dust mite? Nowadays, people all use foam mattresses. When we were children, we were using cotton mattresses. If you go to villages now, there is no foam mattress there. It is some sort of a coir mat type of thing. They don't have dust mite problem. But city people have a lot of dust mite problem because of the type of bedding. And if you look at the foam, I don't know how many people have looked at the foam. You take a piece of foam and with the magnifying glass, look at it. It looks like a bunch of caves, like incredible caves and that is where the dust mite will be and they like that area and does the dust mite come and crawl on your skin no it will not what is the antigenic material which is of the dust mite it is the fecal matter and the body parts okay so whenever and what is the food for the dust mite the dust for, the food for the dust mite is the dead scales epidermal scales of our skin so we have what we call as mitosis every day. We shed skin every day. So the mitosis, if you look at the circadian rhythm, mitosis occurs around midnight to 4 a.m. Between 12 midnight, 4 a.m., that is when we shed our skin. Every day we have new skin, every day. That's why when you look in the morning, you look okay. If you did not shed your skin, you will not look okay. So every day we are shedding skin, these epithelium, are all these are all talking about microscopic things and provides the food for the dust mite as soon as the dust mite eats it defecates and the defecate the, the fecal matter of the dust mite is highly antigenic and the antigen portion of the dust mite is in the gastrointestinal tract so when you and they dies and uh, when you are sort of rolling around in the bed the fine dust mite uh, for the, the dust of the dust mite fecal particles and all that come through the small holes it is in the bed sheets if you take the bed sheet and look and put it on the uh, light you will see very very small holes through those holes these antigens come through and you are inhaling this uh, dust mite dust so that is why first thing in the morning you have a lot of sneezing that is the time asthma exacerbation occurs around 4 a.m. That is the time when your lung functions are the lowest. You have the best lung functions during daytime. So what it means is allergies and asthma is a nocturnal disease because of the environmental issues as well as circadian rhythm changes. So what do we do with this now? How can I prevent the dust mite dust coming out? How can I prevent the dust mite having access to my epidermis is simple. One is I want to reduce the humidity to 40%. So air conditioning seems to help. Another thing is keeping it cool, you know, also helps. As well as this um, boiling, I mean, uh, washing these bed clothes, bed sheets and all that in hot water, 55 degrees centigrade or more. And that actually kills the dust mites. And having these bed sheets and bed bedding in the sunlight, nobody has done research on it, but that seems to also seem to have helped. But 
nowadays all these foam beds are fixed to the mat to the bed itself so it's very difficult to bring it out the fourth last thing would be these allergen encasings allergen encasings are available uh, i don't know about india but probably is available through certain agencies now they are fairly expensive they are good quality it's actually cloth lined plastic it's quite comfortable to sleep on what it does is once you encase the the mattress the box spring as well as the pillows the dust mite has no chance of getting through because all those holes are closed up but they have done studies to find out will these encasings really help to uh, to definitely clinically help these patients answer is no so and doing only encasings alone will not help you have to do both encasings reducing the temperature and washing the bed clothes all in in hot water you have to do all these three things combined then it will seem to be helpful okay so that is about dust mite about cockroach i told you already and to eat in the kitchen not eat in your bedroom and also be aware of what you are eating and be care be pay more attention to what your eating habits rather than the tv better to shut off the tv and all that during uh, eating uh, during dinner time and also not eat and to move your tv out of the bedroom and not to eat in the bedrooms and having uh, this lakshman reka and all those things will partially help but having a professional pest control seems to help a lot for dust control the third thing is rats and mice they are also another major issue you need to be worried about it is the urine of the mice that is antigenic you will not see the mice they everybody nobody will admit oh i have a rat in my house or something but it's quite common the, the urine will dry up and dried antigens becomes a part of the dust okay and that's what causes the reaction so it is you have to again do pest control and also not to store too many food items openly and that's what attracts this um, uh, all these cockroach and mice if you are in an apartment complex and you are on the first floor it is not uncommon to find this say you are on the sixth floor and you find cockroaches and mice you have to worry about it because for every cockroach that you see on the sixth sixth floor there will be 500 cockroaches in the drainage tubes so you have to be a very you have to worry more the higher you go up the less you should see if you see cockroaches high up sixth floor it's more worrisome so uh, we are running out of time but very quick two questions uh, which i thought are relevant uh, one is uh, dr b k gupta from punjab has asked is there any spray for dust mite specific which, what room spray oh yeah they have tried certain chemicals it doesn't work okay and uh, the other question is actually is for the immunotherapy i'm sure the cci uh, people will look into it that they may put up another webinar where we will talk about only the treatment of uh, you know allergic conditions maybe uh, where is important emphasis on the immunotherapy but if quick one uh, one is that dr dc gupta from rajasthan is asking can subcutaneous immunotherapy be given or not just on the basis of allergy test by blood so i mean he wants to ask if we do just an in vitro test for allergy testing and based on that can we administer immunotherapy yes no based no? upon only in vitro test or based upon only skin test if uh, it is not a good idea to institute immunotherapy because as i mentioned to you earlier both these tests technically are fine but what do they actually signify is sensitization sensitization is not allergy so if somebody reacts on those uh, on skin or on immunocap to 10 antigens when you go what we generally tell our students is to after you do the test have a second history we call it 
second history is called summary conference where they sit down and again go through all the test results to find out what is clinically relevant and that is not very easy it takes a while to figure out so you treat the clinically relevant antigen then the immunotherapy will be more meaningful so answer is no do not treat lab tests treat the patient so right. that means you don't agree with this. yeah and uh, uh, i agree with that uh, Absolutely. We should not be treating the lab test. Actually, we should be treating the symptoms of the patients. Uh, the last question for tonight is, uh, uh, there are many, but I think in uh, for the time is running out, I'll just take up the last one, which is kindly specified regarding the mean duration of immunotherapy. I think it's a general question. We could just answer on that and then we can finish it. Oh, duration of immunotherapy is a ranges anywhere from three is minimum. Three is minimum. And average is four to five years. Generally, in our practices, what we do is, uh, now I'm talking about subcutaneous immunotherapy. Sublingual is also same, but except sublingual works a lot slower than subcutaneous. Subcutaneous is more effective. You know, this, if the sublingual takes uh, three years, the subcutaneous actually works within a year, okay? Seems to, it's a much faster and effective. So around third year, what we try to do is tell the patient how you're doing and if there seems to be doing very, very well clinically, then we start cutting down on the frequency of the injections. If from two weeks, we go to three weeks or four weeks even, and then one year we go like that, then we go to six weeks. And if anybody does well on every four to six weeks, then they definitely will warrant a stop in immunotherapy. It is not uncommon around third year, after third year, if it is successfully, if you are treating, not uncommon to find that you are able to reduce many of their medications, including inhaled steroids by 50% in these patients. But the question is, once you stop the immunotherapy, how long will that benefit last? Is the question. The benefit will last uh, for about 70% of the patients, not 100%. So usually 30% of these patients will start having recurrent of symptoms within the next two to three years. 70% of patients continue to do well for 10 to 12 years or 15 years. And who is that 30%? Who is this 70%? You can get an idea as you're tapering it down from four to six per four to six weeks. You might, but that is how you go around with immunotherapy. But uh, but uh, that I'm talking about inhalants for insect immunotherapy. It's also three to five years, but there are instances where you may have to give it lifelong. Right, sir. So uh, I think. All of us, and even forget about us, even the small children, everybody knows about allergy, allergy, and allergy, but it's not as easy as we think about talking about allergy. It is uh, apparently a different ball game, and you have to really give enough time to identify particular patients and particular allergies in the patients, because that will guide you towards the management part of it. As it comes to the immunotherapy, I'm sure it requires a whole big webinar which is just dedicated to the uh, immunotherapy only the indications the contraindications how should we get uh, what are the different methods and whom should we select because that is much much more important which patient should go for immunotherapy which should not uh, we have seen we have seen all of us have seen lots of practices which are happening in country many patients will be taking immunotherapy for six months and they have stopped so better don't do it when you don't know when to stop or how to do it. So I would request uh, the CCI executive members to keep this uh, one of the agenda to bring out, you know, uh, another webinar for on immunotherapy itself, because that is again a hot uh, selling cake. Um, with this, totally. I, would like yeah. to, I would like to thank uh, PKV sir for enlightening us on all the basics as well as you know the very practical tips on the allergen testing as well as how do we uh, manage them how do we avoid them i would also like to thank other panelists dr ganesh dr amit dr pradeep and dr ravi dosi 
for being such a good sport and actively participating in this panel discussion. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, audience, for being such a uh, wonderful audience, being there for us, with us for all the time and for asking the lovely questions, which were really clinical, very really pertinent. Thank you. Thank and you. Thank you, moderator, also. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, all the panelists, and thank you so much, CCI family. Thank you, Adantan sir. Uh, uh, I just sneezed twice, sir, uh, and I noticed uh, that two of uh, my cockroaches came in the room listening to your talk. <laughs> <laughs>